is Gaining Altitude. Conversations worth navigating. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Gaining Altitude, Conversations Worth Navigating. At Delta, the very core of our mission centers around connecting the world, and connections require movement. Every year, we safely move millions of customers and cargo across the globe, connecting them for some of life's most precious moments. Through this discussion series, our ultimate goal is to move important conversations forward so that we can better connect with each other and with our world. Today's episode embodies the theme of movement as we are honored to have Mary Barra with us, who is Chair and Chief Executive Officer of General Motors. Mary fearlessly leads one of the world's largest automobile manufacturers. Safety, sustainability, and leadership are among the topics for today's conversation. And as always, you are a critical part of the conversation as well. So please join us by inserting any questions you have for Ed or Mary in the comments section of your live stream platform. We will go through as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion. So whether you're watching this live or on a Delta jet or listening to this podcast version in your car, let's buckle up because you're in for an amazing and knowledge rich ride. Now it's my pleasure to turn it over to our host, Delta's Chief Executive Officer, Ed Bastian. Well, thank you, Sean. I appreciate that rousing introduction. That's going to go down in the annals of this, of this, uh, this short program here as one of the best introductions we've, uh, we've had yet. Mary, so good to be with you. Thank you. It's great to thank be here. Thank you for being with me. It's exciting. We have so many things to talk about. Unfortunately, we're going to limit it only to about 40 minutes, but we could talk for a couple of hours. But as Sean indicated, uh, we've been holding these conversations with a lot of leaders uh, talking about the world conditions, you know, the situation we find ourselves in, the strength that we get from being with each other and learning from each other and encouraging each other and looking around different corners that, that each of us can see from our own perspectives. And whether it's on the sustainability front, on the inclusiveness front, diversity, equity, you've got, there's so many things we could talk about, not to mention you run one of the very finest automobile companies in the world. And thank you for providing me a little, uh, a little ride in your, your newest Corvette this morning. I, I appreciate that. That's on the, somebody put that, I think it's on Instagram somewhere. Oh, great. They, uh, they put a little, little snippet of that. But it's really great to be, be with you. Uh, so I want to introduce Mary, and unfortunately I need to use some notes because Mary's got uh, a, long, a long list of really incredible accomplishments. But one of the things about Mary, and she's been uh, CEO of General Motors since 2014 and chair since 2016, I, I believe. But under Mary, General Motors has created a vision that I, I applaud you with, a vision of a world with zero crashes to save lives, zero emissions so that future generations can inherit a healthier planet, and zero congestion so customers can get back a precious commodity that is their time. That's, that's an audacious vision statement. I don't know I've ever seen a company's vision statement as audacious. And I look forward to talking about that. Uh, and it's something that resonates closely with us as we build and continue to build the airline of the future. Uh, Mary began her career with General Motors in 1980. I think you were 18 years old, yes. right out of high school, right high school. Uh, in training. And you uh, started as a co-op to start earning some money to pay mm -hmm. for your college, college career, which was incredible. Uh, you graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering in 19. 85, followed by an MBA from Stanford in 1990. Mary serves on the boards of the Walt Disney Company, one of my favorite companies in the world, uh, in addition to General Motors, uh, the Duke University Board of Trustees, and the Detroit Economic Club. And Mary you know, not just has great, uh, a great set of accolades and, and resumes and accomplishments, but she's, she's a living embodiment of, of what it takes to continue to drive our, our companies, our generations, our world, our people, our community to a better place you know, for all. And thank you for, for being with me today. Oh my gosh, well that is so kind. And uh, I have so much respect for what you're doing at Delta. So this is gonna be a great conversation. It's gonna be fun, it's gonna be fun. So I'm gonna jump on in. Um, talked about this audacious 
uh, vision statement, and General Motors has been around for 113 years. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I've seen, I've, I've looked at your vision statement, you've, you've had it out there for a bit of time. And I've often thought to myself, if I brought something that audacious to my board or my company, they, they would look at me and say, wow, that's, that's inspirational. But you know, how, how, do you, how do you start to develop it and bring the team and the board and your, your, uh, your customers along the way? Can you talk a little bit about having that zero uh, vision mindset? Uh, absolutely, and it is something as we looked at how our industry was changing, and we saw a real opportunity, and with General Motors and our, our position in this country of a, of a leading market share, uh, very high brand loyalty, we started to look at, you know, if you step back, and we're very proud of our 100 year plus history, because when, it, when automobiles first became available to, to everyone, it changed their lives. It gave them freedom of movement, it changed the way they live. But as you look over that last 100 years, safety issues, impact to the environment, the congestion we now all face, we felt that we were uniquely positioned now with technology that is available to change some of the negative parts of, of you know, what has really been um, positive for people, you know, to, to get to um, go where they want to go, when they want to go, but now we think the technology exists to address some of the, the challenges that have arisen. And whether it's safety, whether it's emissions, or just making everybody more efficient, that's what our goal is. And so it, it really has served to align the GM team uh, to make decisions on a daily basis mm -hmm. under what we call zero, zero, zero. Yeah, that's incredible. And I believe you've set a vision for 2035, yes. the elimination of gasoline powered uh, for all light duty, yes, yeah. yes. Can you talk about that? Absolutely, and you know, we, uh, we uh, believe in the science of climate change and we know that uh, you know, vehicle transportation is a contributor. And so we started to look at what is it going to take uh, because it's not just, you know, many people today who are buying an electric vehicle, it's not their only vehicle. It's their second, their third, or beyond vehicle. But to really make a difference, you have to solve all the issues. So a person who only owns one vehicle and depends on it for their livelihood, to get, getting back and forth to work or to do their job, how can they um, you know, function and how do we make the experience even better for, from an electric vehicle perspective? And so we looked and we said, you know, 2035, that's, that's what we're gonna set the goal. And it's been helpful in the company because when you're making such a big strategic shift, a lot of times there's a lot of pockets that are saying, hmm, can we do it by 35? Or should we do this instead? When you put it out there and you make it public, everyone gets aligned and now they start making it happen. And our employees were so proud when we put that uh, goal out um, that it, it really has unified everyone. That's incredible. I, uh, I know one of the challenges is the, ele the infrastructure yes. for, for charging. and. Can you, can you talk about how you're working uh, with government and other, sure. other partners to, to create that? I, I'll use my own, I, I've been driving an electric car, unfortunately not General Motors, but I look forward to in the future driving right. electric, a General Motors electric car uh, for six years now. Mm -hmm. And I was on a trip, came back Sunday night late, parked outside my, my office, and I had eight miles of battery power left in my car. And so I had to, I had to find another way home because I didn't have my charger with me and it was, you know, and so I love, I love my vehicle. I love, and, and I'll admit uh, I've, had, I've had that challenge a couple of times, so sometimes I forget. So how do you, you create the opportunity that we're not going to worry about being able to charge when we need it? Well, you have to um, look at where do people want to charge. Clearly the most convenient is at home. Uh, second is at work and then you know point to point when we're moving you know on a road trip and so we're looking at each of those uh, to solve and make home charging easy and home charging easy if you have a garage but we also need to make sure we have facilities set up for someone who may live in an apartment and doesn't even have designated parking right. and so we're working with municipalities we're working with the federal government but we're also working with a bunch of uh, uh, charging infrastructure companies and um, utility companies and I think it's we're all going to come together and we're also making some investment um, ourselves as we look at what the network has to be because it, it is one of those things without that charging network people will not feel confident to buy a vehicle so it's a uh, we have a whole team working on a variety of solutions uh, and and I'm really in, encouraged with what the Biden administration has said because they understand how important it is to have robust charging infrastructure 
infrastructure to drive EV adoption. Absolutely. So while we're talking about the business, I'd be remiss yeah. not to ask you about what's going on with the semiconductor issues that the industry, not just General Motors, is, is facing right now. Right. It, it is a tough situation. And I think uh, what's happened, and maybe you know, there's several out, outcomes because of the pandemic of maybe forecasts were low at the beginning of the year, but then uh, you know, just the usage of semiconductors has, has really increased. I know on our vehicles, when people are buying a full-size truck or utility, it tends to have as much as 30% more chips in that vehicle than, say, a small crossover. Mm -hmm. And so as uh, customer needs are shifting, we need more and more semiconductors. So, you know, I think it, we're working on what's, you know, what's the short-term solution to make sure we run next week to build, you know, cars, trucks, and crossovers. What's the medium term, and then what's the longer term? And I think, um, you know, we're going to make some pretty substantial shifts in our supply chain. We're already working much deeper into the tiered supply base because, generally, General Motors doesn't buy chips. Right. Our tier ones and tier twos right. do, but now we're building direct relationships with the manufacturers. So. Yeah. It's a solvable problem, but it's going to be here a little longer. And, and how much of it was driven by the pandemic? I think a good portion of it was uh, because I think it really, we first, I think there was, um, we didn't estimate demand right at the beginning. We're long past that now, even right. with the long lead time with chips. But I think there's just uh, a need, whether it's consumer electronics. I mean, demand for vehicles has been higher, um, higher would be higher if we had enough chips than it is right now. So I think it, it's somewhat demand based. And then preferences. I mean, the vehicle's just becoming more and more of a software platform, right. and that means more chips. More chips, exactly. So another accolade that Mary received just a couple of days ago, I was, uh, it's funny, I was, my, my team always gives me some background research to, to, to prepare, and I was up in Washington, D.C. yesterday, big thunderstorms in D.C., so I found myself with several hours in the airport time to go, so I did my own research. <laughs> and I saw that uh, Time named you as one of uh, the world's 100 most influential people, which is an amazing, Amazing honor and tribute. So congratulations. We already knew that, but it was good <laughs> to see that publicly. But the point I want to raise is not simply what they did, but you know, Ginny Rometty, who's a who's a shared friend of ours, yeah. uh, wrote a wrote a great uh, letter, and uh, in the in the article, kind of speaking speaking of you of you and why you so rightfully deserve this award. Uh, Ginny wrote. And Ginny, as everyone should know, was the first female CEO of a century-old company at IBM. Right. You're the first female uh, CEO of another century-old company at General Motors. Right. Uh, with fewer than 10% of Fortune 500 companies helmed by women, Mary Barra is a standout and the most authentic leader I know, Ginny Rometty wrote in the Times piece. One might think that more than four decades with the same employer, like her father before her, signals complacency. But Mary is orchestrating a major pivot at the 113-year-old automaker. She's an agent of change, and her power lies in empowering others. She urges women to go for it, knowing firsthand that too often they talk themselves out of opportunity simply because they don't meet an expansive set of predetermined criteria. That's a really nice tribute from Jenny. I was honored. Yeah, yeah. So what I want to talk about for a moment is, and I was struck by, your father worked yeah. at General Motors for four decades. I believe mm -hmm. he was a dye, dye, dye maker. Mm -hmm. You've worked at General Motors for four decades. I know it's hard to believe, yeah. uh, but we're all, we're all getting to that four decade <laughs> mark. And driving such a important, prestigious company with such strong history and legacy to this audacious, visionary goal, that's, that's incredible. How, how do you, how, how did you, you, you come around, you know, kind of realizing the, the magnitude of the change that General Motors was, was needing to make? Well, it, you know, when I was in this role um, early on, we realized that there was technology was going to fundamentally change, and we made the decision very early: we're not going to be disrupted; we're going to lead the transformation. And that led us to make an acquisition of an autonomous vehicle company, Cruise. Invest in electric vehicles. It was over three years ago that we started working on a dedicated electric platform for the full range of vehicles. And so we just started making the investments because we wanted to lead uh, that transformation. And in the other thing I think, you know, 
the fact that I've been there for so long, I know so many people, and the people of General Motors are so dedicated. They work so hard. I, I like to say we have the best team on the field in the in the industry. And so, uh, when you when you get clarity, then you really open up, and and people are empowered to do great things. They know what they're supposed to be doing, and they innovate far more than you could ever spec sitting from you know the chair as CEO or any member of leadership. So it was really unleashing the 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 people of General Motors. Yeah. And how has the team responded? Uh, they, they love it. And one of the interesting things about General Motors that most people don't know is about 40%, over 40% of our salary population has been with the company for less than five years. No. Uh, just due to natural attrition, yeah. we've been um, hiring a lot of people and, and they're choosing General Motors. When we put out our goal to be um, aspiring to be all electric for light duty by 2035, the resumes coming to the company increased. Oh yeah. And so um, the employees are, they, you know, and I think we all know the research says that today's graduates want to work for a company that aligns with their values and is doing something important. And they, they come to GM because of that and are, are inspired and motivated every day. Yeah, that's awesome. I've got another, another piece of research I was doing on my own <laughs> okay. here. That was, it, was, it was fun. So you, uh, you spoke at Duke. You're, you're on the, the board of trustees there. I know you were at the uh, business school speaking earlier this year. And there's a quote from that interview that really struck me. Uh, the uh, dean was, was speaking about taking organizations and you were talking about taking organizations through rapid change and particularly when a time when there's so many undefined you know, elements here that we're still trying to sort out where, where we're headed. Um, and what Mary said was, you've got to have a great team. What enables us to go fast is valuing diversity and it's diversity of thought, experience, and perspective that helps GM make strong and insightful decisions. Tell me about that. Well, I, you know, I, our industry is so complex, and so we need different perspectives. Uh, you know, I'm very proud of our leadership team. There's people like me who have, you know, multiple decades at the company and really know the auto business. But then bringing people from other industries, other countries, other backgrounds allows us to look at decisions from multiple angles. And I would also say. Uh, our board is very diverse and has diverse experiences and so often we start looking at the strategic direction we want to take and the discussions either at the leadership team or at the board help us really round it out and we make better decisions. So I am convinced that diversity of thought that comes through a multitude of different aspects of diversity leads to better business decisions. So our differences that make us stronger. Exactly, exactly. But, but how does it make you faster? Uh, I think it makes us faster, um, well, I think it, that's more about the culture in the company. Do people, you know, we uh, live by a set of behaviors. You know, when I first took the role, everybody said, oh, you've got to work on the culture. And I'm like, how do I work on the culture every day? <laughs> but I can work on how I behave, and because uh, I can change how I behave tomorrow. And so we define behaviors that we rolled out to everyone, every, you know, we, and, and people use them. They'll say, hey, in the spirit, one of our behaviors is be bold. So they'll say, in the spirit of being bold, I'm going to say this. And so I think empowering everybody with a common language and knowing how we want to behave and treat each other allows us to move, move more quickly. I also learned that you coined a new phrase at General Motors, ventilator speed. Yes. That has become one of your favorite terms. Yes. Talk yes. about that. Well, uh, so, you know, when the pandemic first hit, I think we all knew that the world was worried about a shortage of ventilators. And so, you know, we were looking and already starting to make protect uh, masks and other protective equipment, but I got a call from Ken Chenault and he connected uh, General Motors. He said, hey, I think you can help them. We started working with a small ventilator company called Ventec. They were making about 250 ventilators a month. And uh, we got connected and then said, how do we make 10,000 a month? And so two days after the original outreach by Ken, we had a team at Ventec in Washington State learning their production process, getting all the math data for all the parts. Within a week, we had sourced parts at a higher level. And we also realized we needed new sources. So we reached out to the automotive supply base and about 50% of the parts needed for the ventilator came from brand new suppliers. And the automotive supply base just stepped up. 30 days later, we were building our first ventilator. And I think you know when you run a company, if you said, okay, I, we're gonna put this project and we wanna figure out how quickly we can make ventilators, you know, if you could do it in six months, it would have been a miracle. But the team got it done in 30 days awesome. because everybody just, you know, if they got a call for the ventilator project, 
they didn't, they didn't say, wait, I don't have time or I'll, I'll get to that tomorrow. They dropped everything and they did it because they knew it might mean saving a life of it someone was they know. Saving lives, yeah. Right. And that then gave us the confidence of, well, why can't we go that fast on other things? And so we coined the, the term ventilator speed, but it now it's, it's a source of pride and it's kind of reframed everybody to say, how do I just cut through and get the work done? That's awesome. So that's great. Well, congratulations. Well, I'm so proud of the team. Yeah, no, but it's it's it, it, there. There was so much from the last year and a half that we learned about ourselves. Uh, it was right. a tough time, but it was also an incredibly rewarding time in so many ways. And the difference you made for so because you saved countless numbers of lives that you don't know of people, and it's something you know, when when you get down to it, you know, you know, you made a difference in someone's family. That's that's what that's what makes it all worthwhile. Absolutely, and and you know that's rich in General Motors DNA. For you know, any time the country has needed help, we've tried to yeah. to you know do our part. So yeah. it's 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 part of the culture. Yeah. So one of the things I I could use some help in. And I talk to a lot of our, our young people coming up, particularly a lot of our young female mm -hmm. uh, employees and colleagues about opportunities to how to kind of build the career and continue to break those famous glass ceilings and, and, and take on greater and greater leadership and impact in uh, corporate America. You've done it. Uh, you can speak from a chair I can't speak from. Uh, speak to our, to our young female leaders as to some of your thoughts about how to do it, how you did it, what are some of the things to be careful of and what are some of the things to go for? Sure. Well, I think for me, it started, I had a wonderful mother who didn't have the opportunity to go to college, but she believed in the American dream and she believed if you work hard, you could do anything. And so that's the way I was raised. So as I started my career, I didn't look around to say, wait, there's no other women here. I was just like, she said, I had the right to be here. I have the right to be here. I worked hard. I'm here. And that really carried me. It wasn't until I got into the CEO job that I realized when people would say to me, well, you know, now that you as a woman have become CEO, I, I think maybe I can do it. And, and it really started to impress upon me the role that I had to, to be very active in encouraging women to go for it. And so it gets to, you know, apply for the job and don't worry if you only have six out of 10 of the requirements. You might get it or you're gonna learn a lot through the interview process. The other um, thing I really encourage women is find your voice too often, and not all women, but what I, what I see and what I've also looked at uh, the research, often women won't speak up. And they're thinking it, and then someone else will say it, or they, you know, they're, they're worried. And so I'm, my big message is find your voice. Mm -hmm. Have a point of view. You, you won't always be right, but no one's right all the time. And I think if you, and then, of course, work hard. And I think if you, you know, go for it and you don't start to take your out, yourself out of a situation before you've even started, uh, and when you get that little bit of in, uh, uncomfortable feeling yeah. in your stomach, that's when you really need to go for it. Exactly. So that's my encouragement. That's great. You're, you're a great model for that, uh, that encouragement. Uh, one other topic I'm going to ask you about, and then we'll, we'll turn over to questions. I know you're a big believer in STEM education. We were talking earlier yeah. about the work you're doing. And again, congratulations in the, in the local Detroit community, General Motors, and you committed $50 million to make a difference in the lives of our future generation. And, our Detroit schools, we know, uh, need that help maybe maybe more than almost any other part of the country. Uh, talk about STEM, talk about General Motors' commitment to making a difference at home. Well, education is one of our core giving priorities. And when you think about everything the country's gone through, frankly, the globe has gone through, if you, education is the great equalizer because it enables you to, to achieve almost anything. If you don't have a great, you know, whether it's preschool through high school, if you don't have a, a, a good education, it starts to limit you. So I'm, I'm a big believer that if everybody has access to great education, then they can be their best self and they can achieve their life goals. And and so we've worked hard with the city of Detroit. We have more work to do, but it's one of my personal passions. It's why I'm on the, I was on the Stanford board. I served my term there and then joined the Duke board because I, I just think education is so important. I got that from my mom. Mm -hmm. And um, and so when, when people have that education, it really opens doors. So we're committed to working and STEM is so important because there's not a single industry that isn't being impacted by technology. And I'm not saying everybody needs to be a coder, but you should have a general understanding. And too often we find that young girls in middle school start to back away from math and science, even if they're good at it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we invest in you know, girls who code, code.org, just encouraging women or, and young girls to stay with STEM 
and, and then they can choose the path that they want to take when they get a little older and get to college or, or you know, take another pathway. It's something that we do a lot in Atlanta here, and I, I, I know our teams probably should put them together. Yeah. What we're doing in Atlanta public school systems, what you're doing, the Detroit public school systems, I'm sure there's some good learnings Love that we that. can we can work work together on. Uh, one last question. I know I said I would turn it over, but I, I, there's one other question I know I wanted to ask Mary about. I, I love the Disney, the Walt Disney Company. Yes. I, I, people ask me brands, uh, consumer brands that I admire. Disney's always the first one I say, because mm -hmm. the, the joy, the, the, the inspiration they bring, uh, how they are, you know, they've created the happiest place on the earth, and people really do believe when you go, go to Disney, it's, it's true. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I know you've been on the board for a few years about that consumer brand, uh, the things that we can both learn from the Disney company? Sure, well, I think you and I both, um, you know, when we think, when I think of great customer experience, I always think of Disney. So I was honored to have the opportunity to, to join the board. And so much about what they do from a customer perspective, I think any industry can adopt is they empower their frontline team mm -hmm. to do the right thing for the customer, to feel good about it. There's kind of a, what would Walt do? And I think that empowerment they give to, and they, they, you know, in addition to doing your job, whatever, if you're, you know, uh, running one of their hotel at the front desk or you're running a ride, it's really focused on is that, uh, that customer, is that guest going to have an outstanding experience and what can I do to make sure of it? And I think that type of, of empowerment is what keeps that culture and, and you know, the, the leadership position they have in customer, customer experience. Yeah. It's fabulous. It's fabulous. Well, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's a fascinating board to uh, to sit on and great uh, great learnings there. I learn from Bob Iger every day, and now Bob Chapek. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The two Bobs. Yes. Okay. Well, we've been having a nice conversation ourselves. I know the chats probably had some conversation going on, and uh, I'll turn it over to Sean and Amelia at this point. Absolutely. So um, the audience absolutely loved it, and now they're they're sticking to the theme of movement. So we're moving to the fast lane with five rapid fire questions for each of you. So the first one, we'll start with Mary as our guest. What was your first car? A Chevrolet Chevette, because it's what I could afford. Got it. <laughs> Ed? Uh, I had a 1967, it was a General Motors product. It was a, I should have known something for this. It was an Oldsmobile, it was a Delta 88. Ooh. It was a red, <laughs> oh, look at that. Yes. It was, I, I bought it used, I thought, again, while I could afford a couple thousand dollars. and. Uh, at a white top, and uh, it was a big. It was a big car. That sounds pretty cool. Delta 80. You should have known. Yeah. You should have known it. So the next rapid fire is: Where was your last vacation? Last vacation. Um, actually, I, I got to get away for a weekend to Napa Valley, and it was uh, it was very nice. Ed, I'd say my last true vacation was about two years ago, pre-pandemic, in uh, the, the Amalfi Coast oh, okay. in Italy. Uh, went to Tuscany and down to Capri for 10 days, I'd, I'd recommend it to anyone. And now that Europe's open for vaccinated U.S. travelers, I'd encourage you all to go. This, is, this fall is the best time to go to Europe if you're a U.S. citizen. We're trying to get the Europeans into our country without a lot of success yet in Washington. It's one of the reasons I was in Washington yesterday, but it's, uh, it's beautiful. Absolutely. The third question, rapid fire, what is your ideal Saturday? Um, well, I'm a big believer in retail therapy, so I think it would be shopping um, after a workout, or after getting my, my other work done, but I'm, I'm a big believer in shopping. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> uh, Saturday, I'm looking, uh, I, I, I'd love to uh, get up pretty early on Saturday. I love to work out because mm -hmm. it's one of the days uh, that I can find time to work out. During the week, it gets more challenging and, uh, and then have a nice breakfast. Okay, the fourth one. What is your morning routine? Uh, I, I uh, well, I, I, I have to admit, and I know you're not supposed to do it, but the first thing I do when I wake up is I look at my phone <laughs> and uh, check to kind of do a quick triage and um, then get ready. I'm not the most morning person, so I, I pretty much, I think it's because in many parts of my career, I had to be at our, one of our factories at 6 a.m., so I'm very efficient in the get ready process. and. Uh, and uh, you know, then try to kind of catch up on the day uh, with reading a couple handful of newsletters, articles, and then the day starts. Um, I, I check my phone, and probably, probably a lot of people check their phone first thing uh, to see what happened overnight, right? right? To find out what's what's going on. We both run 24/7 businesses, uh, 
find out what happened in Asia or some other part of the world. Uh, I, I've got to have coffee, so the first thing I do is head to the coffee pot and make myself a cup of coffee. And um, I'm usually up by six and uh, spend a little time uh, looking at what my day is going to be. I have a little trick for myself. I try not to look at my calendar too far out in advance. In fact, I try to look at my calendar only the day off pretty much. I, I have a general view of what's happening in my week. But I find if I'm too focused on what I've got to do the next day or the next two days, then you know, I can't sleep. I just, I, just, I just like to wake up and surprise myself, see what my day is going to be. <laughs> a need-to-know basis. I, on a need-to-know <laughs> basis, exactly. So the last question in the rapid fire uh, had a lot of interest is, how do you unwind after a long day? How do you unwind after a long day? Well, for me, I love to, you know, now that we're empty nesters, both our children are not only got, went off to college, but graduated from college, is I really enjoy making dinner with my husband and just something simple or going out and, you know, just kind of debriefing on the day. But, you know, that time where we're chopping things and cooking, I find it very relaxing. Um, unwinding for me after a long day is usually passing out. <laughs> <laughs> not out of drinking, it's just out of, out of, out of exhaustion. I, uh... Uh, I've had a long week. I, I haven't gotten home before 10 o'clock any uh, night this week, so I go right to bed. <laughs> Not very exciting. Well, I love this question that came in from our Delta.com Gaining Altitude audience. So sustainability is a great topic. We're all very passionate about it, but it's also very challenging. So can you both talk about the challenges you see in tackling climate change at the global scale? And then how does that impact your individual company's strategies? Uh, do you want me to start? Uh, so, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I, and I, when you think about it, you know, from an ESG perspective, there's important elements as it relates to, you know, what are we doing for the environment? And at General Motors, we've set clear goals of what we want to achieve and we measure and hold ourselves accountable. In the social space, though, I, I think it's really the work that we're doing on inclusion. And I've, I can tell you in the last year, I've grown so much in knowing, you know, what the work we still need to do to create a, an inc a very inclusive culture. And, and then from a governance perspective, you know, just making sure we're uh, taking all the right steps. So, I mean, each, each of the areas are very important and helping the whole company understand how everyone plays a role, I think, is one of the challenges. And that's what we're working on uh, actively right now. Yeah, I, I agree with what Mary said. And I, I, you know, sustainability for us in our two businesses, you know, probably is the most important issue we face, you know, for the future because we don't have a clean pathway to this. This is, this is not a, a business project that you can put a lot of good minds around and figure out. I mean, it's going to require everyone participating, partners, communities collaborating together, uh, innovation being, being you know, that, that requires massive capital. Uh, but more importantly than anything, it's a commitment, a commitment to change and a commitment to take care of the generations to come behind us. Absolutely. Okay, the next question comes from Delta.com slash gaining altitude. What responsibilities do companies like GM Delta have to help encourage women and diverse candidates pursue techni technical degrees in an effort to increase potential future leaders in technical industries? Well, I think we talked about that a little bit already. I mean, I, thought, I think it starts in middle school of making sure that young, young girls don't take themselves out of the technical fields because if you, if you step back, then you're not in the advanced placement math. You then aren't set up for advanced degrees or even some technical pathways. So I think it starts encouraging there. But then also once uh, people are in the company is encouraging. Uh, we do a lot of mentoring and uh, in engineering and manufacturing. We actually have boot camps to, to kind of help people you know, open their eyes to what their careers can be in a technical area. So it, it's a, I think it's a something you have to work on every day. Yeah. Two of the areas in our business that are uh, the biggest challenge in terms of technical diversity, uh, where, where we don't find a lot of female uh, participation is pilots oh. and mechanics, our, 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 our mechanics. And unfortunately in both areas, I know, I know pilots, it's less than 10% of our workforce are, are female and uh, the mechanics, I don't know the exact number, but it's certainly a number not too dissimilar from that. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do with what you said, Mary, it's getting in and changing minds mm -hmm. in the educational process about people having the confidence they can go do right. you know, these types of roles. I think people look up to people they know, family members, mentors, 
other people they admire. And if they don't see them, if they don't relate to them, if they don't understand their pathway, um, it's hard. It's hard to, to, to get on that technical path and stay focused. And one of the things that we do at Delta is we're very involved in the, the education systems at all levels. One of the programs that I, I've, I've been most impacted by here in Atlanta and, and throughout the U.S. and the world, by the way, is junior achievement. We, we are very invested in junior achievement and the career days and the opportunities that they bring to the kids in seventh grade is usually the age mm -hmm. they see that. And we'll bring, we'll bring our pilots out. We'll bring mechanics out. They'll talk about you know, what they do. They'll talk about how they got there. Uh, kids today will look at mechanics. They think you're talking about an automotive you right. know, mechanic. Right. Uh, aircraft mechanics make a lot more money than automotive camp mechanics. Uh, uh, they're, they're, and they're highly specialized and they're, they're incredibly short supply. And there's a, there's a, there's a pipeline issue for trained um, uh, aviation mechanics and technicians coming up. And understanding is starting to change some of the dialogue as to where we, we can go. Uh, pilots, you know, they, they, you know we'll have, we'll have one of our female pilots or a, a black pilot male come in, and it's just the fact that they, they, they're wearing the uniform, they've got the hat, it's, it's, it's an impressive, but then starting to talk about how they got there right. and, and, and trying to influence them at the earliest stage possible. Now, on top of that, we're doing a lot of other programs to try to bring uh, people in that want to make career changes. We've got a Propel program for working at the university level to bring more diverse mm -hmm. and, and, and different types of pilots and, and, and individuals to the piloting field. Uh, we do that in, internally here at, at the company, too, trying to bring, I know many of our flight attendants or gate agents or other people that always want to aspire to be a pilot, it's, it's expensive and it's, it's not easy to get to. I love hearing the stories about how we're helping them kind of get into those, those different fields. So I think it's everything, but it yeah. certainly starts at the earliest point that you can, you can start to connect where people start to think about what am I going to do someday. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, thank you both for that. And as a female um, math major, I really do appreciate the work you're doing to advance uh, for women in STEM. Um, our next question comes from a Delta employee, and it's a little bit of a vulnerable moment question. So Mary, you spoke earlier about a moment when you felt nerves, and you talked about how you used as inspiration to push forward. So can you talk a little bit more about that moment? And Ed, can you also share a moment when you felt uncomfortable and nervous, and how did you use that to fuel your fire? Well, for me, um, when I was pretty early in my career, I graduated with an electrical engineering degree. So I was a controls engineer working in one of our facilities, keeping the body shop running. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had got the opportunity to switch and become a maintenance uh, uh, supervisor. And I was really nervous because at the time I was 27 years old. And uh, to think that I was going to take on this leadership role, um, it, you know, in an area that you know, with people who had a lot more knowledge than mm -hmm. I did. And so I was, that, I definitely had that pit yeah. in my stomach. It was one of the best decisions I ever made because I learned more about people. I learned how to motivate people, work with people. And frankly, um, I had a great team and they taught me a lot about actually the work they did is, is you know, electricians and pipe fitters and millwrights. So it was a wonderful experience, but I definitely had to be like, you know, I have to go for it. And I bet you can recall how you felt at Absolutely. that point to this day. I, can, I see where I'm sitting when I got the opportunity. That's awesome, that's awesome. Um, I've had a, a lot of similar uh, moments of vulnerability here at Delta. Our, our profession provides those, uh, unfortunately, too often sometimes. But I, I'd say, Amelia, my, the, the one that's most uh, vivid in my mind right now is, is what happened here it's in the last year and a half on the mm -hmm. pandemic. It was really clear that second week of March of 2020, what was happening uh, to our world, not just to our business. And particularly in our industry, going from amazing levels down to less than 5% of revenues in the space of 30 days. It was, it was, it was heartbreaking, it was painful, uh, it was fearful. Mm -hmm. You didn't know what was gonna happen. We had no idea what was still to come, probably a good thing, would have got a, yeah. we couldn't have processed it. And I remember having a pep talk with myself at that point. I just lost my mom. My mom had just died a couple of weeks earlier, which made it that much more hard for me. And I, uh, I remember having the conversation with myself that, okay, um, I didn't choose this. Um, we're a 90-year-old company. We've got you know, tens of thousands of families and lives of people who depend on Delta. Mm -hmm. 
We've got hundreds of millions of customers and communities who depend on Delta. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the time. It's the time to lead uh, and started to look at it as a privilege to lead this company through its worst crisis in its history rather than a burden or, uh, or uh, you know, wonder what happened. And it changed my outlook um, almost instantaneously you know, from that point forward. That is really incredible. Yeah. So based on the comments in the live streams, this has definitely lived up to an amazing and knowledge rich ride. However, we're in the final lap. So Mary, I'm gonna to turn to you. Oh, and gonna, it went fast. It went extremely fast. It, it's movement, speed, a Corvette ad. Exactly. <laughs> it's a fast car. <laughs> Um, so, Mary, we're going to start with you and then we're going to turn it over to Ed. So we're going to end this episode with you asking the same question we ask everybody. How do you think we can better connect the world? Well, I, I think, you know, when you look at um, some of the challenges the world faces right now, and I, I've learned this from one of the GM employees, in every interaction, she talks about being conscious of how you make the other person feel. Do you make them feel valued, important, or do you make them feel like they, they aren't there? And I think if we all had that assumed goodness of others mm -hmm. and then really cared about how did we connect, how did we make, did we show that person they're important, I think that changes everything. Because when I talk about uh, inclusion, and you know, some people will challenge us on our goals for inclusion, but when I say, look, I just want everybody to be able to come to work and be their best self. How can you not want that for everyone? So I think it comes down to how do you make people feel in those one-on-one -on -one interactions wherever you are in the world? That's, uh, that's wonderful and uh, it's very interesting. The, the last uh, guest I had was Danny Meyer, uh, mm -hmm. who's a dear, dear friend. And Danny talked a lot about that. It's how do you make them feel? They don't really care what you know. They don't really care what you said. It's how do you make them feel? Yeah. And those are the things that people are gonna remember. Yes that they're gonna walk home with is how they, how they felt, which enabled the connection to, uh, to the company, to their colleagues, to their purpose, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, I wanna thank everyone for, uh, for joining us today. Mary, thank you most importantly for sharing your, your vision, your aspirations, your audacious goals. <laughs> uh, we join you on audacious goals. We have audacious sustainability goals and challenges as we, we uh, get out of the pandemic. But uh, you're, you're a dear friend and a, and a great leader, and so many of us look up to you, and thank you for sharing your, uh, your heart and your, your thoughts with us today. Well, I, I just wanna thank you for having the opportunity, and Ed, you are someone I look up, look up to, have for years, uh, watch you as, as you lead this phenomenal company and how you led through the crisis, because uh, it was uh, definitely a lot of challenges waking up every morning with new ones. So thanks for the opportunity to be part of the Delta uh, experience here. And I want to thank you for being a great customer, too, because yeah. with our yeah. hub in Detroit, you're an amazing yeah. uh, customer, one of our most important customers. So on top of everything, thank you for that as well. Oh, my gosh. Well, you, you served the, the team, GM team exceptionally well. Great. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you to our employees, our customers, and community for joining us for Gaining Altitude. We hope to see you at our next episode with Jopwell's Chief Executive Officer, Porter Broswell, on Wednesday, October 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Please share your feedback and get the latest updates at delta.com slash gainingaltitude.